Good morning, Rock Hill family. Oh, how blessed we are to be here this lovely Sunday morning. I'm Mackenzie, and I'll be informing you on the birthdays that we'll be celebrating in the month of February. On February 3rd, brother, brother Richard Went. On February 5th, sister Danielle Bell. On February 10th, Kayla Brooks. On February 19th, my amazing father, Brother James Crawford. On February 20th, we'll be celebrating th three birthdays. Sister Linda Crane, Minister Romaine Smith, and Sister Darla Smith. On February 24th, we'll be celebrating two birthdays, Dewan Rugby and Delano Rugby Jr. And last but not least, on February 26th, 26th Brother Deshaun Hamilton. Let's not forget this month is also Black History Month. I recommend that you take some time and educate yourself on the people that helped us get where we are today. Also, this Sunday is Communion Sunday, so take this time now to gather your sacraments for the end of service. Have a blessed Sunday and a blessed month of February. Good morning, Rock Hill family. This is Larry Bonner. As you know, February is Black History Month, but do you know why? And do you know how it came to be? Well, let's talk about it. The founder of Negro History Week was Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Born to former slave parents in 1875, Woodson attended high school in West Virginia, graduated from the University of Chicago with his bachelor's and master's degrees, and went on to become the second African-American to be awarded a doctorate in history from Harvard University. Woodson's professor challenged him to prove Negroes had a history worth studying. Ever after, establishing the field of black history became Woodson's mission. In 1926, Woodson's organization, the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, celebrated the inaugural Negro History Week. When it launched, Negro History Week occurred in the second week of February because the most important events of concern to the Negro took place at that time. Woodson explained, the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, and Frederick Douglass. Over the next two decades, the celebration caught on thanks to black churches, clubs, and civic organizations. 
The celebration evolved and in 1976 became Black History Month. This month at Rock Hill, we will highlight some of the countless contributions that African Americans have made in this great nation. Thank you.
Can you only imagine? Can you imagine just standing before the king? Oh, I can only imagine what it would be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine. Is before me. I can only imagine. I could only imagine to be surrounded by your glory. What will my heart feel? Will I dance?
Good morning. Good to see all of you again on this first Sunday of February, beginning what we call Black History Month during the month of February. And it's good to see each of you here this morning. We thank God for you. We thank God for you participating with us this morning and joining us in our cyber service. Amen. Amen. Uh, what we're going to do, first of all, uh, we're going to have a prayer and we'll come back and we'll do our scripture and then we'll go into our service. Amen. Amen. Uh, before we go into the scripture, I just want to thank God for our media team for all the hard work they keep putting into this to make sure that we get these services to you on Sunday morning. Amen. Um, uh, my mother used to say, uh, give me my flowers while I live. So I'm giving them their flowers while they live. I thank God for them, for the job that they are doing and the things they are doing to make all of this possible on Sunday morning for all of us. Amen. God bless their hearts. We ask God to continue to bless them in their ministry and all their endeavors that they set out to do. Amen. Let's prepare for prayer. Father God, we come once again. Thank you for allowing us to be here once again. And Father, we realize that uh, you allowed us to rise this morning once again, uh, standing uh, above ground. And we know that's a blessing in itself. And Father, we come this morning letting you know that we do not take this for granted. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Now, Father, right now, we ask you to bless this word this morning. Father, we ask to open up our hearts and our minds that we may be able to accept the word this morning that you have for us. And Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking that you allow me to decrease while you increase. Father, I'm asking right now in the name of Jesus that you would make it plain so that your people will understand what you are trying to convey and get over to us uh, this day. And Father, when that time comes that we have to leave this world and transition into the better place, Father, we ask you right now that you would give us a home somewhere in your kingdom. All these blessings we ask in your son Jesus Christ's name. And all of God's people said, Amen, Amen, Amen. God bless your hearts. We, we thank God for you being here this morning to share with us on this first Sunday. Uh, in February. Uh, also, today is our communion Sunday, and we will be serving communion at the end of this service. Amen. So you can start preparing now your sacraments, get them ready, because we will be having communion immediately after the service. Amen. Amen. So if you would this morning, we're going to ask that you would turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. Amen. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 12 beginning at verse number 20. Acts chapter 12, beginning at verse number 20. And I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Amen. The New Living Translation. Again, that's Acts chapter 12, beginning at verse number 20, all the way down to verse 24. Amen. And it reads as thus, beginning at verse 20. Now, Herod, was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. So they went, sent a delegation to make peace with him because their cities were dependent upon Herod's country for food. The delegates won the support of Blastus, Herod's personal assistant, and an appointment with Herod was granted. When the day arrived, Herod put on his robe uh, royal robes sat on his throne and made a speech to them. The people gave him a great ovation, shouting, It's the voice of a God, not of a man. Instantly, an angel of the Lord struck Herod with a sickness because he accepted the people's worship instead of giving the glory to God. So he was consumed with worms and died. Meanwhile, the word of God continued to spread, and there were many new believers. Uh, if you would, if you go back to verse 22, uh, we will take our text from verse number 22 and read, The people gave him a great ovation, shouting, 
It's the voice of a God, not a man. Amen. My brothers and sisters, when you read Acts chapter 12, verses 20 through 24, you, you get a sense of this story that um, uh, King Herod was the king at this time. And, and the, uh, the two countries, uh, cities, Tyre and Sidon, they depended on the king uh, for food. They pe depended on him for uh, their living and the things that they needed, supplies. He was the one they had to come and get them for. Now, but what you must understand, they did not have an army. They didn't have uh, troops that could go out and fight. Uh, they, they had nothing that they could render to the king for all the things that they would ask him for. So uh, what they would do, uh, what they did was they decided that they would set up a meeting and, and, and the king's personal assistant set up a meeting for all of those leaders to come and have a sit down with King Agrippa that, uh, so they could continue to get supplies and food and all this stuff that for them to live and uh, the Bible said that when they set up this meeting, on the day of the meeting, he dressed himself in his royal robe. He sat up on his throne. Now, remember now, he sat up on his throne. And when they came for this meeting, he began to talk to them. He began to give them some words. And according to the Bible, that said when you read Acts chapter 20 through 24, that they was just flattering him about how he speak and how well he was dressed and the things that he did that day. In other words, uh, uh, can I use this term? This is not in the Bible. They was kissing up to him because they knew that whatever they did that day in that meeting depended on how well they performed before him to get supplies and get the things they needed to be able to live and continue the life that they were used to. So the scripture says that when he made this great speech to them, he, he, he um, just talked and talked and talked. And when he finished, the Bible said that they said, oh, what a great speech. What great words. What great words. Matter of fact, in that verse 22, it said the people gave him a great ovation. That means they stood up. They was clapping. They were just shouting. And they said, it's the voice of a God, not of a man. Now watch this. The word God in that sentence in verse 22 was a small g, which that would let you know right away that that, was, that they were saying was just here, that's just talk. That's all it was, just talk. But the problem came in is that he allowed them to put him on a pedestal, not thinking that everything he had came from God. He allowed them to give him these ovations and shout that he sounded like he was a, a, a God. They said it didn't sound like these words came from a man. It sounded like it came from God. And he ate this up. He accepted that ovation from the people. The danger was, is that he allowed that little moment to tear him apart and cause his doom. If I could just for a few moments, I'd like to speak from this subject or this thought. It's a dangerous thing to steal God's glory. It's dangerous to steal God's glory. Repeat after me. It's dangerous to steal God's glory. Amen. And he allowed them to put him on a pedestal. That means that he was stealing God's glory. He didn't let them know or he didn't tell them that all I have is not my own doing, that it came from the true and living God. The question is, have you ever met a person who bragged, one that bragged all the time about uh, what they do, how they do it, what they have, what they don't have? Uh, 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 and, and a person who boasts is a person who enjoys flaunting their accomplishments in front of others in ways that suggest they are superior while others are inferior. They 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 want you to believe that they are more superior than anybody or anything. And, and even to the person they talk to, they feel that they are inferior to them. No one likes a person who brags because the ultimate intent of bragging is to belittle others. The, the whole intent is to belittle other people. Can we really brag about anything we have achieved or acquired? 
what it all about. What, what is it all about? What is it all about? Whatever you achieved in life, whatever the goals that you have reached in your life had nothing to do with you. What am I saying? I'm saying it was all because of the grace of God. And none of us have room to boast about God's grace that he allowed to flow a blessings that he allowed to be stored up on us. Christians don't brag about things because we know that none of them, what none of that we have comes from our own efforts. We may wear the fine clothes, but we never brag about them or belittle others who cannot or choose not to be do the same. We don't brag about how much money we earn while belittling someone else's family. Neither do we brag about the quality of our neighborhood and breathe those who have berate those who have not been blessed in the same way. We can't brag because we know the source of our blessings. Our pound is upon the full with fresh water, but we know that it is fed constantly by a stream coming from the hills. I that's why Psalms 121 says, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Psalm 121 let us know that whatever it is we have, whatever we have acquired in life, whatever education status we have obtained, it was not done on our own might. It came from the hills from which cometh what? Our help. That's what Psalms 121 says. We can't take credit for what God does for us. I don't care what uh, Chief Justice Clarence Thomas says about he pulled himself up by his own bootstraps. We as Christians knows where our help comes from. God bless the dead. So was it with the new kid on the block, Herman Cain, that says he built his own riches. But we as Christians know that our father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Today, a person who takes credit for something that someone else has done is usually accused of stealing that person's thunder. That's why it is very important to not take credit for what God has done for us in our lives. Everything we acquire, everything that come through us, every blessing that we receive, all the favor that we receive, it comes from our God. Those who take credit for what God has done, a person who are robbing God of his glory. It is dangerous to steal God's glory. Moses learned this lesson on, in the wilderness. God told Moses to satisfy the thirst of the people by going to a certain rock and speak to the rock, which would produce enough water to satisfy their thirst. You know the story uh, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, God told Moses, well, the people was complaining, number one, they were complaining, complaining that they didn't have no water. They was thirsty and they needed something to drink. And then they told Moses and they told Aaron, you, you all brought us out here to kill us. You brought us out here for us to die of thirst. We could have stayed in Egypt, but you brought us out here to kill us a lack of thirst, no water. They was complaining. Matter of fact, Moses and Aaron got afraid because they were complaining constantly against them and they got afraid. And, and God told Moses to, to, to satisfy the thirst of the people. He said to go, uh, go to the rock and speak to the rock. In response to the constant complaining of the people, Moses in anger struck the rock instead of speaking to it as instructed and gave the impression that he was, he was providing them with water instead of God. That was still in God's glory. That was still in God's glory. He did that. Him and Aaron did it. Now watch this. God punished them for that. First of all, neither one of them, Aaron nor Moses, made it to the promised land. Matter of fact, Aaron died first on top of a mountain. God told him, said, you're going to die on top of this mountain and you're going to go to where your other ancestors are. And then Moses, he took, told him, said, listen, for your disobedience of disobeying me and taking credit for that that I have done with my people. He said, I'm going to allow you to go to the top of the mountain and you're going to look over into the promised land. You'll get a chance to glimpse it. You'll get a chance to see it, but you would not make it there. Not only that he told, and you would die afterward right here on this same mountain. After you take a glimpse, you're going to die right here. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Uh, he took credit for God's miracle and his punishment was that he would not be able to enter into the promised land. In his last days, he climbed to the top of Mount Moriah. 
and viewed the promised land, but he never stepped foot into the land of promise because one day he took credit for God's miraculous work. A person who brags, their conversation is filled with I and me. The believer's conversation is filled with thanks be to God. As Christians, we have learned that we should give God praise for all he has done for us. We have done nothing on our own power, but all has come as the result of the mercy and the mercies and favor of God. There is nothing we do in life. There is nothing that happens in our life that we have done on our own merit. It took God. Now, I don't care what it, you're waking up this morning was because of God's touching you this morning to wake you up to see a brand new day. You still, uh, as we know, you're still on your job. That's because of God's favor, his mercies upon your life. It has nothing to do with you. It's all because of God's favor on your life. My brothers and sisters, this text focuses on an instant when a king was praised as a God and was instantly struck down and became dinner for the worms. It is da it's a dangerous thing to take credit of something that God has provided or done. The background of this text indicates that King Herod, dressed in a royal robe, regal grounds, gave a lengthy speech to the people of his kingdom concerning royal matters. According to the Bible, knowledge commentary, Tyre and Sidon were Herod's dominion and for some reason had incurred his wrath. Because these cities depended on Galilee, uh, Galilee for grain, they desired to make peace with King Herod. The two countries would totally depend upon Herod's favor. Without it, they could not exist. They had, to mili they had no military power by which to bargain with him, and the king owed them no favors and was not obligated to them in any way. The only hope of success they had was to favor themselves before him and to shower him with praise and glory. Baby, don't let nobody shower you with praise and glory. This would not have been unusual for a Roman emperor because Romans believed that the emperor was God honored. So did Egyptians and many other pagan nations. However, Herod was not Roman. He was a Jewish king and Jews believe in the only one God. That's enough right there. He was Jewish and the Jews only believed there was only one true and living God. So he really stepped way out of his boundaries. He, he was raised to know that there was only one true and living God. And he stepped way out of his boundaries by allowing the people that was dependent on him for supplies and foods, these countries, to put him on a pedestal. And he accepted all of God's praise. The ancient historian Jehoshaphat also recorded events of that day. He notes that Herod came into the room wearing a dazzling robe made of the fine material that caught the sunlight and almost blind the eyes of those who looked up on him. Too many, the glitter and the flash, the dazzling and the blinding only serve as proof of his divinity. When the people of Tyre and Sidon honored him as a god, Herod was no, no doubt flattered. He loved it. Don't let nobody put you on a pedestal. Don't let nobody make you feel that you're better than what you are. That's what he did. He allowed them to put him on a pedestal. He allowed them to put him in a position that he did not deserve to be in, but he allowed it to go on. God was very upset with him because he allowed. Now, he could have stopped this. He could have stopped and said, hold up. I'm Jewish. I only believe in the only true and living God. In other words, he allowed it to happen. Be careful when you allow people to put you in a place where you don't belong. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. He was struck down and he was eaten up with worms because he tried to take credit for that which belonged to God. This New Testament occurrence reflected similar occurrence in the Old Testament where those who tried to take credit for things God had done were punished or those who refused to give God credit were, were equally punished. If you don't know, learn anything else today, know this. Do not take credit for the things that God has done 
before you. Yes, you may have gone to work. Yes, you attained a doctorate, a master's, a whatever it is you attained. It was not on your own might. Give God the praise. Give God the glory. Let him know how appreciative you are of the things that he have done for you. It sends a New Testament signal to all believers under the new dispensation that it this dispensation that it is not good, a good idea to steal gl glory from the true and living God. I want to talk to you about stealing God's glory, stealing God's glory. There are at least three thoughts that were should be derived from the demise of King Herod. Here's number one. We have no reason to boast. We as a people have no reason to boast. Why? Because we serve the only true and living God. We have no reason to boast. Herod's demise was a case of misplaced pride. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and halting is before it fall. While he did not boast aloud, he allowed others to give him more credit than he deserved. I just told you, don't let nobody give you more credit than you deserve. In other words, they can say it. You can't stop them from saying that. They can say whatever they want to say. But behind that, you said, but thank God be the glory. It was all because of God it had nothing to do with me. Believers have no reason to boast about anything because everything that we have came directly from God. This makes us extremely humble. We do not consider ourselves great in our own eyes because we know that without God's divine influence, we will be nothing. So we are not quick to boast. We know we are empty without God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, Paul said, but whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me and not without results. For I have worked hard. Then any of the apostles, yet it was not I, listen to Paul, yet it was not I, but God who was working through me by the grace. The Christians know that we don't do anything without God's intervention. We don't do anything. There's nothing we accomplish without God being a part of it. All, not a part of it. It's because God took, he took it and poured it out on us. The Christian recognized that he or she has been guided to this point in life, not by our own knowledge, but by the wisdom and intervention of God himself. The knowledge should humble us to know that we are what we are only by God's grace. It's only by God's grace. Here's my second point. There's an angel watching. There is an angel watching. When Herod accepted the praise that he did not deserve, an angel of the Lord immediately smote him. We like to think of angels as always those being that are standing close by to bless us. However, if we look at this passage, just a few verses up, verse 7, we will see the same angels who smote two people in different ways. In the first instance, Peter was in prison and the angel of the Lord smote him to wake him up and to free him from imprisonment. This is the angel, the same angel who opened the jail doors, opened the gate and blessed Peter with his freedom without having to post a bond. This angel demonstrated the delivering hands of God. It demonstrated the blessings hands of God. Yet by the time we get to verse 23, this is the same angel, verse 22 and 23. This is the same angel who smote Peter, now smoked Herod. But the results was just the opposite. We all have an angel looking over our shoulders, but unlike the television series, angel who touches us is not always blessing, especially if we are living outside of the will of God. We have to understand that everything that goes on in our life, everything that happened to us, whatever has been given to us, it is because of the grace of of the true and living God. We cannot take credit for that regardless of what it is. It doesn't matter. If you're able to walk from your bedroom to your kitchen to put some water in a glass and drink, that was because of the grace of God. It had nothing to do with how strong you are or your own might. It was because God allowed you to stand up and walk from your bedroom to your kitchen, pick up a glass, fill it with water and drink. That was God's favor. It was an angel of the Lord that brought down fire on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
It was also an angel that warned Balaam what sought to prophesy for profit. The same angel that touched one man and blessed touched another man who displeased God and made him a dinner for worms. We need to be careful how we act when God blesses us. The same angel that blessed in God's name in one verse of your life is the same still around when you decide that you don't need to praise him. Keep your promise or pay the price. We should resolve to praise God continuously for he is good and his mercy endured forever. Here's my third point. Let's talk about worms on the inside. Worms on the inside. Think about that. Worms on the inside. When Herod was stricken by the angel, it was discovered that he had worms that were eating him from the inside. He was smitten by the angel of the Lord, but worms had been eating away at him for a long time. It just didn't show. It's the same thing that happens when we slice into a juicy red apple and discover that there is a worm on the inside. The question today is, how did the worm get there? There's no hole on the outside. Look at your apple. When you discover a worm on the inside, there's no hole. on. The, how did it get there? There's no bruises. There's no obviously indicates something is wrong, but there is a worm on the inside of that apple. Somewhere before the apple made its way to your table, a fly using something we would call a stinger or a shoot punched an almost invisible pin sized hole in the apple and deposit eggs in the apple and grew into a worm and they grew fat and slimy, eating its inside. When we feel for some reason, as long as I come to church on Sunday, I don't have to come to Bible study on Wednesday night or Sunday school on Sunday morning. That's when the outside looked perfect, but the inside is fasted with worms. When we want to attend, when we, we want to attend Bible study every now and then, or choose not to attend at all. In a spiritual sense, the same thing happens when we first begin to feel that we don't need to really worship, praise, or serve God on a regular basis. It's like a little pinhole that leads us to skip worship. Failure to read our Bibles or no prayer life at all. Inside the little worm of self-reliance grows bigger. We feel we can succeed in school, business, politics, and life without God, at least not in the heavy dose. Like Herod, we look the same on the outside, but on the inside, the worms are growing. Yet there are certain fruits that move no worms. Oranges, tomatoes, and lemons have no worms. The, the reason why, there's too much citric acid in them. Worms can't live there. You see, attending regular Bible study and Sunday school is like putting citric acid into our souls. No worms can live in a body with citric acid. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23 says, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. When our lives are filled with righteousness living, regular worship and praise and service to others, it puts together a citrus mix that's so strong that worms can't get in. I want to talk to you about glorifying God. Glorifying God. Finally, my brothers and sisters, we need to remember that the reason for Herod's demise is that he didn't give God the glory. If we want to continue to be blessed, then we need to keep praising the Lord. Herod was one was part of a family of men all named Herod who had a history of doing terrible things and thinking more of themselves than they should. One Herod was struck on his stuck on himself that he called himself Herod the Great. He built the third temple. But when he found out that it, it might be a new king born in Bethlehem, he might be greater than himself. Instead of praising God, he ordered the murder of all little boys in Bethlehem. Another Herod called himself Herod Antipas was the one who conducted the trial of Jesus and put a purple robe on his shoulder and laughed at the Son of God. 
Another Harold called himself Harold Agrippa II, the son of Harold Agrippa and great grandson of Harold the Great. He was so bold that he made his sister his girlfriend. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. When Herod Agrippa came along in this text, he was one in a long line of Herods who felt they really didn't need to recognize God or live by his rules. We have a lot of Herods today feel we don't need God. We don't need his rule. We can do it on our own. We can't do it without our true and living God. Some like Herod are living lives by their own rules. Some like Herod are viewed themselves as above the laws of God. You cannot escape God. Some like Herod are violating God's laws about relationships and marriage. Some like Herod are beautiful on the outside, but on the inside they're full of worms. Anytime we begin to believe we can make it without public worship, God, we are getting ready to be filled with worms. Anytime we begin to believe that regular praise and worship is not necessary, we're getting ready to be filled with worms. Anytime we to believe that we can't just keep asking blessing without showing God some love in return. We're getting ready to be filled with worms. Oh, I wish I had some witnesses this morning. I don't know about you, but I found out that when God has done something good for us, we should be willing to glorify him and show gratitude. We should tell him our jobs. Tell him, tell it to the songs we sing. We should tell it in the joy that bubbles in our souls. We should give God the glory for taking our bitterness and turning them into sweetness. Our sadness and giving us joy. Loneliness and giving me companionship. Emptiness and giving me fulfillment. Failure and showing me the victory. Discouragement and giving me encouragement. More than that, we should give God glory for saving our souls. I don't know about you, but every now and then, I want to tell somebody that I uh, serve a God. I want to tell somebody that he carried an old rugged cross. I want to tell somebody how he died out on Calvary. Can I tell you how he died on Calvary? It was one Sunday, Friday afternoon. They marched him up Gotham Hill, put a crown on top of his head. Made him carry an old rugged cross. Oh, can I tell you the story? They tell me that they beat him with whips. He bled. They speared him in his side and blood come running all out on the ground. They tell me that they took a crown and pinched him in his head and blood ran all down his face and all in his eyes. They tell me he died one Friday afternoon. Laid on a bar tune all night Friday night. They tell me he laid in a bar or tomb all day Saturday. They tell me he laid in a bar or tomb all night Saturday night. Oh, but can I tell you when joy came, the Bible said it was early one Sunday morning, just before the dew fell. fell. He got up out of that grave, stepped out on dry land, looked up towards heaven and said, all power is in my hand. Not some power, but all power is in my hand. We thank God for that. He still had that same power today that he had 2,000 years ago. Nothing has changed. If anything has changed, it's us. God has not changed. We, 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 we did all the changing. I'm reminded of a story. A man and his wife got married. They was dating before they got married and they were set in a car and she said, you remember when, when, when we used to ride, you, you could only see one in the car. She said, after we got married, we arrived. You still could only see one in the car. We were so close. She said, we were close. Everybody knew how close we were. She said, but I want to know what happened. What happened to us? What happened to us? What went on? What happened? The man said, I haven't moved. I'm in the same place I was when I met you. If anybody moved, it was you. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. That's the way it was us. God has not changed. He has not moved. If anybody moved or changed, it was us. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. But you can always slide over and come back and get connected with God. It just takes a little bit of effort to say I'm going back home and pick up my rightful relationship with God. That's all you have to do. 
Say amen if you can. God bless your heart. We thank God for you out there this morning. We thank God for your tuning in this morning. We're going to offer the invitation to discipleship. If you're here this morning and you watching us out there in Cyberland and, and you're not saved and you want to be saved, you want to be uh, close to this God that we're talking about that died for our sin, that gave us a, a chance to the tree of life, a life here on this earth, and you want to know about this man, we ask you to give us a call on our line, 407-977-9309. Give us a call, and we'll pray with you. We, we will ask God for your forgiveness. We'll ask God to forgive you for all your sins. We want to ask you that you believe in this God that we're talking about. Just give us a call. The second call is if you move to this area and you was a member of a church in another city, another state, another country, another county, and you have not connected with a church yet, and you would like to become a member of this establishment here at the Rock Hill Missionary Baptist Church, give us a call on our number 407-977-9309. Amen. You get that same number. You can give us a call. If you desire prayer, give us a call. We'll pray with you. 407-977-9309. Give us a call right now. Right now, we're waiting. Uh, there's somebody standing by right now that you give us a call. Uh, 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 while you're watching the service, just tap in that you want prayer. We'll pray with you right then and there, right now. Just uh, right there on your television set. There's a little side there that said prayer request. Just hit that little section, and we'll immediately know who you are, and we will pray with you. Amen. 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 The other thing is, we want to thank God for you. We're into a new year. This is the second month, beginning of the second month of the new year of 2021. And um, I want to thank you for your giving that you gave to us, to this ministry in 2020. And we want to encourage you to continue to give to the Lord uh, in this new year. Uh, because we are able to bring you these messages on Sunday morning due to the fact that you are giving to this ministry. Amen. We thank God for you. Amen. There's many ways you can look down on the bottom of your screen. There's many ways you can give to us on Zelle, um, other ways. Just look down on the bottom of the screen there. And, and uh, we have someone here at the church. If you live in the area, you can drop it by at our church here. The address is there. Uh, uh, Sunday morning between 11.30 and 12.30, you can drop by and uh, you drop off your uh, uh, love offering. We'll be most certainly glad to be someone to be here to take that from you and thank you for it. Amen. Amen. Listen, we're going to be uh, uh, serving communion. We're going to give you a few moments to gather your sacraments and we're going to be coming back and we're going to uh, do our communion. Amen. Amen. Just hold up one second. We'll be right back. This is the bread to represent his body that was broken out on Calvary. Let's eat all of it. This is the wine that represent the pouring and shedding out of his blood out on Calvary. Let's drink all of it. God bless you. We thank God for you. We thank you for tuning in this morning. Guess what? We love you. We love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. See you next week. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.